Our gospel reading today comes from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. Let's listen now for God's word. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Uh, This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At the moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I enjoyed very much participating in the first Christmas Eve worship services with you all just a week ago, although it feels like it was probably six weeks ago somehow. Isn't that funny how Christmas just skews our sense of time? So... It was fun to see all the families and uh, little ones present for the 4.30 service. In that service, I was seated where Joe is, and I had two young ladies up there with me, and they were doing a great job as readers, reading the Christmas story through the letters of the alphabet. We enjoyed some special music from children, as well as adults, and we heard the Christmas story, as we always do, and then we closed by singing Silent Night. But for me, the highlight was seeing the Edwards family star as the holy family in our nativity scene outside. Baby Ella was a fine baby Jesus, don't you think? So we thank them and all the others who helped bring uh, that special scene to life for us, both at 4.30 and at 7 o'clock. And it warmed my heart to see folks of all ages worshiping together. That is not an unusual occurrence, of course, Sunday services, especially these that are combined, often have members of several generations praising God together in worship. But there's something about welcoming the Christ child in that context, in that intergenerational fashion that just makes that service extra special. And that experience called to my mind a passage from our Presbyterian Directory for Worship, which our denomination recently rewrote to give us fresh language to express our theology of worship. And it says this, In Jesus Christ, the church is called to be a royal priesthood, giving glory to God in worship and devoting itself to God's service in the world. Worship is a collective activity of the people of God and an expression of our common life and ministry. Now, of course, it is a challenge to have that many generations involved in leading worship Uh, on a weekly basis, and even more so on a day like today when we're in this uh, season of Christmas and a lot of folks are on holiday. And that's one reason we are only having one service today. 
after the busyness of last Sunday with one morning, three evening services, 750 people, as Joe mentioned, we're giving ourselves a bit of a break. I expect that Mary and Joseph felt rather fatigued, too, eight days after Jesus was born. Jesus was likely not always the docile baby that we find in our manger images, don't you think? I mean, if God was going to embrace the fullness of humanity, that would include everything that tries the patience of new parents, right? I know it's kind of weird to think of the Savior of the world whose birth was announced by angels and who was venerated by wise men from the East as having a dirty diaper, but there it is. So Mary and Joseph, eight days later, were learning this reality too. Despite their weariness, however, they had a job to do. Now, I'm not referring to the general call of parenting, but to a specific task, and that was to present baby Jesus in the temple. A ritual that was prescribed by God in the law reminded the nation of Israel that he delivered them from Egypt. The Israelites brought their firstborn male children to be circumcised in observance of this deliverance as a symbol of their redemption from God. Now, the fact that they did this tells us that Mary and Joseph were observant Jews. They were faithful to the call of God on their lives. Knowing that Jesus was a special child, such observances would have had even greater importance for them, for they wanted to model faithful behavior to them, even in his youngest days, for surely he would have questions for them when he grew older. Now, as you all know, we have our own ritual in the church for presentation of children and adults to God, baptism. Of course, baptism, it's much more than a ritual of initiation. It is a sacrament, a sacred act observed by Jesus himself as an adult. Let me return to our directory of worship so I can share some of our theology of baptism found there. It says, like circumcision, a sign of God's gracious covenant with Israel, baptism is a sign of God's gracious covenant with the church. Both believers and their children are included in God's covenant love. The baptism of believers witnesses to the truth that God's gift of grace calls for our faithful response. The baptism of our young children witnesses to the truth that God claims people in love even before they are able to respond in faith. Most baptisms in our Presbyterian tradition are infant rather than adult, yet both are equally valid, both equally important in the life of the believer and the life of the family of faith called the church. And the church is equally responsible for nurturing the faith of both the infant and the adult baptized person. And what's more, Infant and adult baptisms have an identical aspect that, as one of my favorite confessional statements says, in life and in death, we belong to God. I believe that Jesus, or Joseph and Mary rather, understood this sense of belonging to God on a deeper level than most Jews, thanks to the extraordinary events surrounding the pregnancy of Mary and the birth of Jesus. But just in case they needed a reminder, the Spirit has another gift for them eight days later as they prepare to meet the priest and present baby Jesus to him. As if he were an NFL linebacker, a stranger interrupts the handoff, scoops up baby Jesus, hoisting him heavenward while praising God with this unusual song. Imagine if we were preparing to baptize an infant on this chancel. The parents are gathered around the font. The extended family is uh, sitting near the front of the sanctuary. Paraments of white adorn the pulpit and the table. The parents are about to 
hand off the infant to Pastor Joe, when suddenly a fellow comes out of the sacristy and takes the baby in his arms. Even if we knew this interloper, it would be a bizarre, if not chaotic, scene. Now, imagine that this same person begins to sing this song of praise and prophecy in the midst of the sacramental ceremony. Our Presbyterian sense of decency and order would crumble, wouldn't it? Now, as unlikely a scenario as that is for us, so it was for the folks in the temple that day. But Simeon's action was not the random rambling of some madman. Rather, it was the public revelation of the gift of prophecy that could only be conferred by the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that Simeon was righteous and devout and that the Spirit rested on him and even sent him into the temple at just the right time so that he might find the salvation and light the revelation and the glory that God promised him he would see before his death. But Mary would not have known this about Simeon. So when Simeon looked at her and said that the child in her arms would lead people to both falling and rising, that some would follow and some would oppose, and that many people would be forced to make a decision about Jesus, most especially herself, it must have freaked her out quite a bit, despite the fact that his ominous statement immediately followed a blessing that he offered to her and Joseph. But if you think about it, you should not be too disarmed on Mary's behalf. After all, deciding about Jesus is something we do every Sunday, isn't it? We decide to come to church We decide to continue to follow him. We decide to step into our various roles as the family of faith. Following Jesus is not a one and done decision. It is a constant discipline, like exercise, maintaining a good diet, getting enough sleep, all those New Year's resolutions that we'll make with vigor tonight and perhaps quickly forget in a week or so. But they are a vital component of our spiritual health, continuing to follow Jesus in all of these ways. And it's not just participating in worship. It's getting involved in the life of the church beyond the worship service. It's committing to Bible study, to mission service, to care for other faith family members, and all the other ways that the body of Christ stays spiritually fit. Mary and Joseph understood this fundamental aspect of obedience to God, as Luke tells us. And the confirming witness of this other servant of God, though disarming, would have a lifelong impact on the faith journey of Jesus' entire family. An interesting aspect of Luke's account of the life of Jesus in his gospel is that often we see these pairs of experiences of male and female characters. In this passage, he does so by telling us about Anna, immediately after telling us about Simeon. Anna is specifically named a prophet, a rare occurrence in Scripture. And though Simeon is not labeled as old, Anna is of a great age, that is, 84. Uh, Despite her age, she is fit enough to be constantly in the temple, Night and day, fasting and praying all the while. She hears this great commotion from Simeon, and her prophet's instincts tell her to join him in praise, for she knows who this child is as well. So we have Anna, who we know is an old woman. Simeon, who we can reasonably assume is old on account of this promise that the Spirit made him, that He would not see the Messiah before death. And both of them are powerful witnesses in this story. I want to contrast their witness with a story I heard on the radio show Marketplace about the coming shortage of airline pilots. The mandatory retirement age for airline pilots is 65. And it's estimated that in the next 10 years, half of all pilots will be retiring from major airlines. 
Regional airlines have more than doubled pilot starting pay in response to almost $50,000 a year on average, offering signing bonuses of up to $31,000, and they're helping to pay for flight training. Any young people out there looking for a career, this might be something to consider. The big airlines have hired more than 4,000 pilots this year, an eight-fold increase from just five years ago. This employment trend is kind of mirrors other professions that face the same challenge. Even the ministry, as baby boomers reach retirement age. But as a culture, we are very youth-oriented. In the church, we obsess over how to reach younger generations that are not coming to worship. Meanwhile, we often take for granted the faithful service of the retirees in our midst. In the temple, the wisdom of these elders was a valued gift. Nobody batted an eye at calling an 84-year-old woman a prophet, because who else was willing to fast and pray 24-7? Mary and Joseph stood by and watched with amazement as Simeon took baby Jesus in his arms instead of calling the authorities and screaming in terror because Simeon's words and witness had lasting value. Eric Danielson is a journalist and a blogger for Think Christian. He recently wrote a post about the career of Steve Martin, as you may know, Steve cut his teeth in stand-up comedy before becoming a Hollywood star. Now, lately, Steve has focused on his musical talent with the banjo, recording and touring with bluegrass and folk artists like the Steep Canyon Rangers and Edie Brickell. But in this post, Danielson wrote, Our culture's greatest fear is not death, but dying. It has no idea what to do with the aging process. Creative, resourceful souls like Martin are rare role models. Theirs is not a stereotypical American dream, but a vision of abundant life from start to finish. We don't have to assure ourselves that 60 is the new 40, or fear growing useless, we can run the race to its end, finding much to enjoy and embrace along the way. Now, for successful and well-off folks like Steve Martin, this vision is easier to embrace. But for the average retirement age churchgoer, it presents more of a challenge. But that's a major reason that such folks keep coming to worship, doing the tedious and often unsung committee work, or just helping behind the scenes in whatever way they can. They know that abundant life can be found within the walls of the church. And what's more, that this life is not a solo tour, but a stage that is shared by many acts, whether they are children, youth, young adults, middle-aged, or well-seasoned. Now, in my short time here at Markham Woods, I have sensed a spirit of togetherness and camaraderie, a spirit that values the contributions of all ages to the common life of the church. I hope that my sense is sure and that this spirit is long-lived. I want to return one last time to the Directory for Worship, to the statement on the theology of baptism. One part of that statement reads, Baptism is the bond of unity in Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, we are made one with Christ, with one another, and with the church of every time and place. In Christ, barriers of race, status, and gender are overcome. We are called to seek reconciliation in the church and world in Jesus' name. It's said that when Martin Luther, the great reformer, felt the temptations of Satan. He did not focus on his individual belief or the strength of his faith, but shouted, I am baptized. By this, Luther was acknowledging two things. First, 
that he had been presented to and claimed by God as one of God's own. And second, that faith in Jesus Christ is much more a team event, like a relay race, rather than an individual event, such as a sprint or a marathon. Friends, we are one family of faith located in a particular time and place. But like hundreds of thousands of church families in this country alone, we acknowledge one Lord, one faith, one baptism that marks us as God's own. We all have gifts to share, and we are called to nurture each other in our collective faith journey, regardless of our station in life, so that together we can be the most authentic and effective witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that in 2018 and in every year thereafter, we will continue to support each other in prayer and join in praise of our Lord, whose kingdom shall have no end. Amen.